So if you do have a Bible, Luke chapter 24 is where we're going to spend our time together for just a few moments. And then Pastor John is going to come and share a little bit more about the Easter message. But last thing I'd say before we consider Luke 24, tomorrow we start a brand new Daily in the Word reading plan. We have an opportunity to stay connected together in our walk with Jesus by daily being in the Word together. And so we've put together a small reading plan that just gives you weekday readings. I think of a chapter a day, but it accompanies through YouTube or Facebook, whichever is your, you know, poison there, or pleasure, let's say it that way, um, a little video, two to three minute devotional that's put together by our pastoral team. And so that'll also be launching tomorrow. If you're one who would like to discover more about Jesus, I'd consider, maybe consider joining us April, May, and June through reading John, Acts, and the book of Romans. And if you need a little like daily YouTube devotional, my wife and children, we watch it every morning, and we found it to be a wonderful tool for us in discipling our kids. Um, 8 a.m., Monday through Friday, watching a two-minute devotional with our kids. We're seeing great fruit from that. So anyway, if you'd like to grab one of these on your way out, um, they're just meant to be a helpful thing for you to daily follow Jesus. With that said, Luke chapter 24, looking at verse 1, Dr. Luke Physician Luke was not one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. He was a hired analyst, a hired historian, a hired fact checker. Ever heard that word? Maybe once, twice. He was a guy that was hired most likely by a gentleman named Theophilus. Isn't that Theophilus name you've ever heard? Pun intended. There's no names like that happening nowadays for babies. But anyway. He was hired by Theophilus, which was very customary in that day and age. Physicians were sometimes, the, the servants became physicians because people liked to travel with physicians, and so they'd have their servants trained. Interesting little tidbit that you don't really need to know, but there you go. But Luke was hired to give an account. I don't know about you, but let me have your attention. Let me, let me see your eyes if I can. I have noticed that in 2019, 2020, and 2021, there's been this challenge to discern the validity of information. That it's been hard to wonder, is the source of this information uh, real? Is it uh, agenda-free? Is it motivated by anything other than the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God? I don't know. And I think there were a lot of people around this time first century, that maybe we're experiencing that same dynamic. Hey, we heard about this guy named Jesus, a dead carpenter. And there's 500 eyewitnesses that saw him post-death walking around. It wasn't a hallucination because mass hallucination doesn't happen in that way. There's 500 eyewitnesses. Hey, maybe we should get a guy like Luke to discern the credibility of this information. No agenda, just to present the information. Well, look at what Luke writes here in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. I'm just going to read a few verses. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared for Jesus' body. But, listen, the plot begins to thicken in verse 2. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. There was such concern that there would be, well, an agenda for people to pretend. See, he rose from the dead. So, what happened the Roman guards placed a stone in front of the entrance to the tomb. And it was guarded by men who, if they left their post, they were signing their own death warrant. These men were motivated to keep this stone right where it was. And then these women show up on a Sunday morning. Where's the guards? Where's the stone? That would have been too heavy for three Roman guards to move. This is peculiar. This is out of the ordinary. This is unexpected. 
So maybe trepidatiously, the women go in, verse 3. But the plot thickens again. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled. And two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling clothes. This is the chapter and verse where you get that, like, proof text to dress up on Easter Sunday. Right here. These two men, they dressed up suited and booted, right? They were ready for church. Well, verse 5. Listen, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. The women were terrified. I mean, the guards are gone. The stone's gone. The body's gone. And there are these two, two men suited and booted for Easter Sunday. Like, hey, like, what in the world is going on here? The women were terrified and bowed down to their faces on the ground. And the men asked a question I think you could hang over every endeavor that is not motivated by God, I think. Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Why are you looking for life and that which where it's not found? Why? I am not that smart of a person. But I recognize that if I want to talk to someone about, like I have this electric bike. I want to talk to the designer of that bike when I have an issue with it. So I do. Hey. Here's my problem. I need you to fix it. Okay, he does it. God is the designer of life, not your friends, not the media, not some religious figure. I say go to the designer to find out more about how life should be lived. He's the one who designed it. So let's listen to him. Here's what I find so interesting. They ask, or these men, this question, why are you looking among the dead For someone who is alive, look at verse 6. He isn't here, for he is risen. Oh, man, first service responded. Second service, he is risen. There you go. You're already asleep. It's okay. He is risen from the dead. That's right. That's right. Here's what I find so interesting. Dr. Luke had no agenda But to fact check the situation, this is the situation that he reported. But, you know, years ago, my brother and I, you know, this is kind of one of my first Easter's here on this campus. And I don't know, Cece, what's it been, like a decade and a half or something since we've been here? We lived in Destin for a while. And then anyway, but we used to do this like thing before Easter with a little microphone and a video camera. And we'd go out like on spring break on Pensacola Beach and just ask people. Hey, man, what is Easter? And you get, hey, that's, the, that's the birth of Jesus. Kind of. Like, you know, like the second birth, you know, like he came back, you know. And then that suited and booted phrase, I'll never forget that. You know, like one guy, hey, man, what you doing on Easter? Well, I don't know, but I'll be suited and booted in church with my grandmama. And I was like, okay, well, that's awesome, bro. That's awesome. Suited and booted. I'd never heard that phrase before, but I thought, well, I don't even have a pair of boots, but, or a suit for that matter. But I'll, you know, I'll be in church. But um, we asked so many people, and it was so, you know, I think it was, like, interesting and revealing. Like, whoa, you mean, like, three miles away, people have, don't have a clue who Jesus is? You mean the mission field isn't over there, it's right here? You mean the 23,000 people that live in Midway and in Little Tiger Point and Gulf Breeze, maybe someone needs to tell them about Jesus? You mean life here isn't all about the next pursuit? And that there really is no such thing as a forever home, except for the one that's made without hands. But that's home. This is work. This is work. This is where we are on mission to see people experience new life in Jesus. And you are either on mission or you're missing out on what life's really about. You're missing it, man. It is not about the third home. It is not about that portfolio. It is not about your kids getting into the right institution. It's about life. The purpose of life is to live. It's that simple. Jesus said, I came to give life and that kind of life that's abundant. It's the enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And you can tell Who's following which agenda? How? 
I, I, I call it the ABCDs, attitude, belief, choices, and decisions. Those tell me who you are. They tell me whose father you belong to. They tell me. They're tells. Like, I'm not a good boxer. I mean, look at me. You hit me right here, I'm going down. But, like, there was one time where I tried to box, and, and you could learn tells. Like, okay, if he shifts his feet, he's about to throw a jab. Move. It was a tell. And I give tells. You give tells all the time of what you truly value. How do I give a tell? Attitude, belief, choices, decisions. Here's an E. They evidence if it's Father God, F and G, or somebody else. They truly do. Attitude, belief, choices, and decisions evidence whether you belong to Father God or someone else. And the beautiful thing that you're about to hear from Pastor John is how to experience new life in Jesus. But this question, what's Easter all about? Why do we do it? What do you do on Easter? There's a lot of questions, and there's some fun answers. This week, we put together a little um, opportunity for some of the kids in the church to respond to those questions. So I'd like to share with you some of those responses, and then Pastor John's going to come and close out our time together this morning with really an opportunity for you to respond to the greatest message ever, the message of Jesus. Let me ask you to turn your attention to the screen, and we'll check out what people think about Easter. Hey, Coastline. Today, we asked Coastline kids their thoughts on Easter. Let's see what they have to say. What is the first word that comes to your mind when I say Easter? Uh, bunnies. Uh, eggs. Candy. Jesus. What is the first word that comes to your mind when I say Easter? Easter. Um, resurrection. Perfect. Egg. Um, Joy. Bunny. Um, what are you doing for Easter this year? A Easter egg hunt. H hide some eggs tomorrow. I'm going to go to my grandparents' house to do an Easter egg hunt. Um, an egg hunt. Hide Hide <laughs> Okay. Hiding eggs and finding them. Having an Easter egg hunt. Uh, let's see, I'm speaking at church. I'm baptizing people. Getting baptized? You're getting baptized? Yes. Um, we're this Easter. Wait, can I read your mind for a second? Okay. Is it an egg hunt? Yes. What's your favorite Easter candy? The little Reese's eggs. Ooh, I got one. There's chocolate around it. It's like an egg-shaped thing. There's chocolate around it, and there's marshmallow on the inside. Whoa. Peeps. M&M's. M&M's? That's not really an Easter candy. <laughs> it's just like a Peeps. general. Peeps. Peeps? That's a good one. The Reese's. Um, <laughs> bacon. Bacon? Jelly beans. Why do we celebrate Easter? Because we just died on this cross for our sins. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Because God rose from the dead. It's because Jesus died on the cross for us. Nice. And he rose again. And he rose again. Because Jesus died on the cross. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Because Jesus died on the cross. Because Jesus rose from the dead. Well, that's pretty much the only reason Easter is for. Jesus is risen. Happy Easter. 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 So when, when I was asked to do that little interview, I wasn't told I was going to be inserted. I'm suing for elder abuse. 
So we'll see what happens. In 1983, when my wife and I felt led to start the church here, I'll never forget going to Oriel Beach Elementary School right down the street here and knocking on the door of the principal of that time, a man by the name of George Dahlgren. And I spent some time in George's office, and he asked me questions. Who are you? Where are you from? Why do you want to do this? I said, well, I, I grew up here. This is my hometown. I, I went to Bible college down in Lakeland and seminary in Kansas City. Um, I've been married for X amount of years. My wife and I have a two-year-old son. And he said, well, you know, here's the thing. You can rent the school, but it can only be for two years. We don't allow people to stay within the school building longer than that. And so we decided, after a lot of prayer, we'll go for it. And that very first year, I knocked on a lot of doors myself. In fact, I surveyed the area. I had a little survey I would do. I'd knock on the door. Someone would answer. I'd usually have one or two other people with me, and I'd say, hey, uh, my name's so-and-so. We're starting a church. Just wonder, do you go to church? Oh, you do. And uh, how many times would you say you go a week? Once, twice, three? They'd give me an answer. I, then, I'd, then I'd ask them this question to see if they're really telling me the truth. So who's the pastor? Um, let's see. What is his name? And many times I would have an opportunity to even share with them the gospel. I'd ask them a question like this. Can I ask you a little a, a personal spiritual question? I'm through with my survey, but I would like to ask you a couple more questions, if that's okay with you. Sometimes they'd say yes, sometimes they'd say no. And one of the questions I would ask them was this. Have you come to the place in your spiritual journey where you know for certain if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. And some people would say, well, I go to church, I've been baptized, I've been confirmed. And then I'd ask them this question. This would be my last real question. Well, suppose you were to die and stand before God. And he were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And it was very interesting to get some of the responses and sometimes people say all kinds of things, and I would say, well, you know, I believe that about you. You're a good person. You do this and do that. But you know what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that will get you into heaven. And then I'd have the opportunity many times to share with them what the Bible does say. It started with just a simple knock on their door. I'll never forget one year, 2011. Valentine's Day on a Monday afternoon, my wife and I were home by ourselves, and there was a knock on the door. I thought, wow, I wonder who that could be. The sun was setting, and it was Valentine's Day. I go, and there, standing on my front porch, is my niece. I said, what are you doing? What, what, what's up? And she told me that my older brother, Yancey Spencer, had just passed away of a massive heart attack in Malibu, California. I said, what? And I was just kind of stunned. And, and, I, and I share that because you never know who's on the other side of that door. You, you never know what's going to happen the next day. There's an amazing passage, and I'll just read the one verse from Revelation chapter 3. And these are Jesus' words, verse 20. He says this, Behold, and whenever you see that word behold in Scripture, it means pay attention Something powerful is about to be said, and Jesus says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. Does God knock on the door? Does he speak? I mean, does he knock on the door of a person's life, a person's heart? with a desire to come in. It seems like that's what he's saying. After his crucifixion and Jesus rose from the dead, if you remember the story, Mary came early in the morning to anoint the body. 
and it wasn't there. And she was weeping and crying, and she saw a man, and she asked him, she supposed that he was a gardener, and said, Sir, if you'll tell me where the body is, I'll take it. And then she heard a voice that said, Mary. And she recognized the voice. And she said, Rabboni, teacher. And she fell at Jesus' feet. See, Jesus came calling. Jesus came knocking for Mary. And she heard his voice. He came to Peter after the resurrection. Several of the disciples who were discouraged and in doubt decided to go fishing with Peter back to the Sea of Galilee. Peter had denied Jesus three times. He had cursed and swore and said, I never knew the man. And Jesus came knocking. Jesus came calling. He saw them out there. He put a little charcoal fire on the beach. He was cooking some fish. And he yelled out to the disciples, children, that's the word he used. Have you caught anything? No, we haven't. Let let the net down on the other side. And suddenly the net was just full of fish. And Peter, who had seen this happen before, said, it's the Lord. The Lord came knocking. He came calling. And he restored Peter to himself. He appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. They were huddled in a closed room. Everyone was there except for Thomas. And Peter walked, I mean, Jesus walked in, pardon me. And he said, peace, shalom, my peace be with you. He met a couple of travelers after the crucifixion, leaving Jerusalem, heading to Emmaus. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were without hope. They had thought Jesus was the one, and then he was crucified. And Jesus walks up, the risen Savior, next to them and says, why so sad? Why so depressed? And they said, are you the only one in all of Israel who hasn't heard? And Jesus said, haven't heard what? And they told him about the crucifixion. We thought he was the one. And Jesus began to knock. He began to reveal who he was to them. And they regained their hope. They regained their expectation and their life in Christ. Now, I want you to hear this. Please tune in. Maybe you're here today. And in our time together, the Lord will knock on your heart. He will call you to himself. And I want you to listen for just a moment because at the end of the service, and I want you to be thinking about this, at the end of the message, and it's not going to be that long, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that knock, to that call, and I want you to start thinking right now, what am I going to do? Am I going to respond to the Lord if he knocks on my heart, if he calls me? Am I going to open the door and let him in? Listen to what it says there in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, if anyone will open the door, I will come in. Jesus stepped into the life of Israel at the age of 30. Yeah, he had been there for a while, but just as a carpenter. But at 30, he stepped into ministry, baptized in the Jordan, and no one had ever seen or heard anyone like him. For three years, he lived around Capernaum down there by the Sea of Galilee, and he taught, and crowds began to follow. He did amazing miracles. In fact, the very first one he did was in Cana, where he turned water into wine. Now, that got some people's attention. This guy makes wine. They began to follow him in huge crowds. He he did all kinds of things. He turned a small basket of food, of fish and loaves, into enough to feed 5,000. He opened blind eyes. He touched paralyzed people who had never walked before. And they began to leap and shout and praise the Lord. No one had seen anyone like this. Jesus was brave enough and powerful enough to touch a leper that no one would go near. And he was cleansed from head to toe. One day a woman who had an issue of blood, a hemorrhage, saw Jesus and had heard about Jesus. And she said to herself she had spent all her money on doctors and she only grew worse, the scripture said. 
She thought, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'd be made whole. And that day she touched him, and Jesus asked a question, who, who touched me? And she finally came forward. She finally said, it, it was me. And Jesus says, go in peace. They often tried to trap Jesus, those who were envious of him, the religious leaders of the day, and, you know, kind of try to discredit him. And one of the big tricks they had one time was, well, we know the Jews hate the Romans because of the heavy boot of taxation. And we know that the Jews have to be loyal to Caesar. So we'll ask him this question. Jesus, is it lawful for us as Jews to pay tax to Rome? And they said, well, if he says yes, then the Jews will turn their back. If he says no, then we've got him with treason and sedition. We'll have him arrested. So you know the story. Jesus said, hey, who's got a coin? They handed him a coin. He held it up and said, whose image is on this? They said, well, Caesar's. He said, well, then just give to Caesar those things that belong to him and give to God the things that belong to him. Jesus taught about salvation. He taught about eternity. He taught about heaven. He taught about hell because he knew all those things were real. And he made some amazing statements. One time he made this statement, which I think is probably one of the most powerful things he ever said. He said, what would it profit an individual, a man, he used the word man for, for all, all mankind. So what would it profit them if they gained the whole world? If they had houses all over the world and yachts and all this money, and then they lost their own soul. I mean, that's a powerful statement. What good would it be if you spent your whole life amassing all this money and then you died and went into eternity without the Lord? He talked about our need for forgiveness. He talked about our failures. And he said he'd pay the price for them on a cross. And he made some bold claims about himself. Jesus once said, I'm the way, I'm the truth. And I'm the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And, and this really disturbed a lot of people. And, and one time a religious leader kind of came to him in secret at night because he didn't want the other leaders to know he was doing it. And so at night he had this meeting with Jesus. And he says, we know you've come from God. No one could do the things you do or teach the way you teach without having come from God. And Jesus cut through the whole thing and he said, I know why you're here. Because of your hungry heart, your thirsty soul. I know what you're looking for. And Jesus said, what you need, this man's name was Nicodemus, what you need, Nicodemus, is a new birth. You need to start all over again. You need a relationship with God the Father, not religion, not ceremonies, not, not certain rituals. You need a relationship. He didn't quite understand the whole thing, so Jesus looked him in the eye, and this is what Jesus said to him. He said, Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever, if anyone, would believe on him, trust in him, he would not perish but of everlasting life, because God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. And listen, right there, Jesus was knocking on the heart of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, do you hear my voice? A lot of people say Jesus is not the way. His enemies crucified him because they called him a blasphemer. But he rose from the dead. That's why we're gathered here today. And not just us, but literally, listen, millions and millions and millions of people gather today all around the world because Jesus came knocking on the door of people's hearts as a living Savior. And he said, come to me, and I'll give you peace. Come to me, and I'll take away your loneliness, your fear of death. I'll give you assurance of heaven. See, our, our culture kind of wants to keep Jesus on the sidelines, keep Jesus in church, keep him there. Not in our schools, we pushed him out. 
Not in our politics, we don't want him there. Not in the mainstream, keeping buried in religion and rituals and controversy. And a lot of people believe Jesus is just some religious historical figure. Some philosopher, not a savior. Agnostics say, well, you, no one can know for sure, so they bury Jesus under doubt and uncertainty. How can you know for sure, they would say. Some just neglect Jesus, never even check him out. Some people who are, who are maybe their hearts are tender or they're afraid or they don't want to give up something in their life, well, they, they bury Jesus. They bury him in alcohol. They bury him in pleasure. They bury Jesus in busyness and trips, and, and they find themselves sometimes very lonely, very hurt, and very fearful of their future. Jesus says, if anyone, I'm knocking, I'm calling. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. See, see, that's part of my story at the age of probably 19. I was a high school dropout. I was a local surfer around here. My mom was a single mom of five kids. And we were all very alive. It was the 60s and 70s. We had long hair. We were surfers. We wore puka shells. We were cool. But we were also lost. And we were into drugs and all kinds of things of that day. And the Lord came knocking. He came calling to me. My brother got saved first, and then some of his friends. And then, then the Lord just began to tug at my heart. And I remember saying, Lord, if you can forgive me, and if you can change me, if you can come into my life and do anything, I'll open the door. And it was miraculous. I began to change, give up all these old habits that I could never give up before. And I found out something that I never knew, that God had a plan for my life. But so did the enemy. And the enemy had been after me. See, God's not mad at you. He's not out to get you. He died on the cross for you. He came not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Saved from self, saved from sin. He came to show and reveal to you the Father's love and so that you can know him, you can experience him. And, and, and one thing I could say to you that's very true, Christianity is not psychology. It's not, well, if you think these things or think positive. No, it's not that. It's life transformation. Christianity is not philosophy. Oh, well, that's your philosophy of life. No, it's transformation of life. It's not religious rules. It's not confirmation or baptism or I did this when I was a kid. It's recognizing my need and hearing that knock and that voice and opening that door. It's realizing that I can have a life not filled with guilt, not filled with shame, not filled with fear, that I can be forgiven and I can start all over again. And that's what happened to me. You might be here today and say, well, John, it's too late for me. I'm too old. Jesus says, if anyone, hear my voice. Well, I I'm too young. I I'm not ready. Hey, if anyone would hear my voice and open the door, I would come in. Well, John, you don't know me. I've never been able to live a Christian life, and, and I don't think that I could do it, and I don't want to fail. Yeah, but Jesus says this. Listen, if anyone, anyone, it's not a game. It's not a gimmick. It's not a trick. He comes. He knocks. He calls He's real.
And maybe you're here today. And he's been knocking. He's been calling. And today, you would be willing to make a decision. You know, it's been quite a while ago, quite a while ago, my wife and I got married. And I, I got this, like we heard this guy recently say, you know, your soulmates are prison mates, one of the two, cellmates. And he described the ring as a shackle. But this, this, this ring identifies the fact that I'm married. And I wear it every day. I'm not ashamed of being married to my wife, Lynn. I could understand her being ashamed to be married to me. But you know, Jesus makes this statement. He says, if you're ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, I'll be ashamed of you when I come with all my angels. Jesus made this statement, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Peter, who had denied him, later would say in one of his writings, there's salvation in no other name but Jesus. You say, well, Peter, how do you know that? Because his life was changed. He knew what it was like to be forgiven. And today, my prayer, my hope would be that if you're here and you're a prodigal, you walked away, or if you've never, ever, ever received Christ, or you say, John, I'm just not sure. Well, the Bible says these things are written that you might know you have eternal life. And I want to give you an opportunity today to respond to him. 